Good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for coming out on this rainy evening. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, a young woman that I went to high school with, who is actually the head librarian here, um, Anne Lacey. And I said, yeah, you worked in your summer jobs and your part-time jobs. Give him a wave, Anne. I haven't seen her for decades. It's amazing. And my mum and dad just drove over from Credit Woodlands. So this really, for me, is um, coming back to uh, the hood. So I'm going to be giving an unusual talk because halfway through, for those of you who don't know the inspiration for the title, Inch by Inch, Row by Row, I have dragooned my husband, Pete Ewins, Dr. Pete Ewins, who works for World Wildlife Canada. He's going to come up here and sing the song for you. So there's going to be some live music as well. So here's a map of my talk. And um, I don't know whether we're, are we going to have these lights on the whole time or can we dim them? I don't know whether people can see. Is there a possibility to, to dim it? Just it, it may be easier for you to see the slides if we can do that. Uh, but I want to give you a little bit of an outline of where we're going to be going in the talk. We'll be talking about our landscape, what we see when we look out of our window, whether it's our garden window or the plain window, past and present. I'll talk about biomes and ecozones, gardening zones, photosynthesis. Um, I'm going to stick some science in here, whether hopefully it will be quite palatable and very accessible. I'll talk about ecosystem services and then about digging up your lawn for local food and native biodiversity. And on this map, you can see where we are at the Central Library, and my mum and dad just came over from Eagle Mount Crescent, if you follow the blue line. So um, this really, for me as a teenager, after they emigrated from England to Canada, and I went to high school at, at Holy Name of Mary on Mississauga Road with Anne. Uh oh, there's more than one Holy Namer here. Um, this, this was, I've, I've really witnessed the, the changes in the landscape of Mississauga. So you may not realize this, but most Canadians live within 100 kilometers or so of the Canada-US border. And here we are in the, in the really pretty much the deep south of Canada. And this part of the country is the most densely settled, urbanized, industrialized part with high, high intensity agriculture. There's only about 5 to 15 percent of natural habitat left. And we are in what is technically known as the mixed wood ecozone. So it is this purple part of the map. Oh, I actually have a, um, just realized, thank you, Kirsten. You can see we are down here in the mixed wood ecozone. Eco but our landscape uh, generally, as we drive around southwestern Ontario, is uh, something like this. Here you can see on the, the QEW, uh, we're going over the, Burlington Skyway, and you can see in the background the Niagara Escarpment, one of the most important landform features. This is not the view from Pearson Airport. This is actually the boreal forest flying over parts of Nova Scotia uh, en route to Halifax. So not our landscape. This is our landscape, and it really is it's a built-up one, but people always t say to me, look how many green trees there are. And Toronto, yes, we, we are very grateful for our urban forest. It does a lot for us in terms of giving us ecosystem services. We'll talk about that later. If we go, were to go back in time, 150 to 200 years, this would be our landscape. This is the forest in Rondo Provincial Park in southwestern Ontario near Chatham. And this is where you can really see it's a, it is a forested landscape that we live in. Um, we do sometimes see that urban forest. And this is uh, a view from the research tower at York University looking over the common. So what this actually means is that when we identify from landscape, uh, land uh, aerial photographs and uh, do GIS work, that in southwestern Ontario, which we call the Carolinian life zone, because a lot of the species are species that occur in the Carolinas, north and south, and they're reaching their northernmost limit here, we see that uh, we've got some green areas, not many of them. We've got Pinery Provincial Park, 
up near Grand Bend. Here's Pinery. We've got Rondo Provincial Park. We've got Point Pelee National Park. We've got Long Point. But for the rest of the landscape, we've got fragmented or scattered pieces of forest interspersed with lots of farmers' field, fields and ever-expanding uh, towns and cities. So I want to turn for a minute back to when it was mostly forest to a quote from a very important person in the life of everyone who's interested in nature and the environment, and that's Alexander von Humboldt, who was written about by Andrea Wolfe in a fantastic book. If you're going to read one book this year, um, I would say borrow from the library the invention of nature. Humboldt recognized in the late 1700s, he lived to be 90, so he did get to do a lot of writing of his research. He realized that nature was a web of life and a global force, and as he traveled around the world, from Europe to South America and Central America and Canada, he realized that he was seeing similar kinds of vegetation landforms. And he called them uh, biomes. This is what we know as biomes, and we are in the forest biome. So does anyone have any questions before I move on? I've put lots of slides in here to remind me to call out for questions. We're all good. Okay, carrying on then. So, what are biomes and ecozones? If I could beam you all, this entire room, to the equator, we would find ourselves in tropical rainforest, kind of jungle-like vegetation. If we spent the next few weeks, or in my case, months, walking towards the North or the South Pole, so if we we're at the, starting off at the equator with tropical rainforest, we walked North to the North or South Pole, we would find ourselves walking through gradients, gradients of temperature, it would get cooler, gradients of moisture, it would get drier. And as we walk along these gradients, we would see very different uh, plant forms and life forms. If we walked up a mountain along an altitudinal gradient, we'd walk through these different zones. So we'd walk from the tropical rainforest through the temperate deciduous forest, through the taiga, which is tundra with a few trees, past the tree line to the tundra and then the ice caps. And this diagram here is one of Humboldt's original figures uh, from uh, 1807. So he really recognized these, these landforms. So here is temperature going from cold to hot along the bottom, and then precipitation, rain, snow, from very little to a lot along the top. If we were in a hot, wet place, we would be in a tropical rainforest. If we were in a cold, dry place, we'd be in the tundra. If we were in a hot, dry place, it would be the desert. We are somewhere in here. Temperate, seasonal forest. Not too hot, not too cold. That's our particular biome. And this is a map of the world showing all different biomes. And you can see in pink pinkish. These are deserts, desert in Australia, desert in North Africa, desert over here, lots of deserts. But we are in this bright green biome, the temperate forest. Because of the Gulf Stream, which takes these warm water currents up towards Britain and Scandinavia, what you see here is that these, this kind of bright green zone is shifted, it's sort of up a bit and we see arboreal forest, which is underneath this temperate forest um, label, is at a higher latitude. So biomes are recognizable areas of different kind of vegetation. If you're in a desert, you know you're in a desert because there's lots of cacti there. But what I want to point out here is here's Toronto, here we are. Here's Tromsø, a city in Arctic Norway. And what's really interesting is that because of these gulf stream currents, we find our provincial flower, the trillium, and I'm wearing a trillium silver pin here, growing very happily way above the Arctic Circle in Tromsø's botanic gardens. So, it, it, you can, so depending on the prevailing climate and temperature, um, um, moisture, precipitation, different species can have different ranges, but we recognize different kinds of 
dominant landforms. So here we are again down here in our mixed wood, uh, mixed plains, mixed wood plains, which is our eco zone, which is a smaller chunk of the temperate forest. But as I said earlier, the landscape has changed. And when you look at this pink here, this is urban development. We've got a lot of this light yellow agriculture and relatively uh, small amounts of the dark green. So what this actually means for our native biodiversity, our native plants, its genetic variation, is that a lot of those species are at risk. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about how you can do gardening in urban areas and suburban areas to actually help our native species. So you can garden for conservation. Um, that was, by the way, never a thing in the 90s and 2000s uh, because everybody thought, well, you know, you have these cities, you're put pouring concrete over everything. How can that help native biodiversity? There's a net loss. But now we know that you can actually uh, do this kind of, of gardening and it can help a lot. So here's a definition of a biome. It's a formation of plants and animals with common characteristics due to similar climates, and you can find the same biomes in different continents. Okay, everyone with me so far? Making sense, excellent. So what about gardening zones? Here's another way to slice and dice the landscape. Um, different species will survive in different areas depending on their ecology. So not only do we have these biomes across the world, we also have their equivalent for gardening zones. So you wouldn't, for example, plant a species that needs to uh, grow in Florida because it can't tolerate the cold temperatures of Ontario. Uh, so you wouldn't plant something that is growing happily down here, up here. But something that grows up here might do okay further south. So these are, this is the idea of hardiness or plant zones. Um, Canada has its own set of hardiness zones, similar to but slightly different from the United States. The US gardening zones are based on temperatures, the coldest temperature uh, that can be tolerated by a plant. Canada's plant hardiness zones take account of seven different variables. And they are sort of corresponding, but there are subtle differences. So when you go to the garden store, the gardening center to buy a plant, you'll, you'll notice on the label, it will say, uh, will survive in such and such, such gardening zones. Unfortunately, climate change is changing these, shifting these, as we'll see um, in a minute. Okay, I've got some quotations from, uh, you'll see Nobel Prize winners, from Alexander von Humboldt. Now here's a quotation from um, a uh, coaster that my mother-in-law gave me. If you want to be happy for a short time, she's, she's about to turn 90. <laughs> she gave this to me a few years ago. Get drunk, happy for a long time, fall in love, happy forever, take up gardening. So I think I would like to get you all onto that page. Uh, gardening you can do, it's a very diverse kind of pastime. You can grow local food, you can help native biodiversity. It's a great thing to do. And I'm happy to say that my husband, who did his doctorate as an, in ornithology, um, he's an expert on birds, he's actually finally taken up gardening seriously. So I'm really happy about that. Just keep an eye on the time. Okay, so let's turn a little bit to why plants are so important. Uh, basically, without them, we'd all be dead. And Albert Zentz-Georgi, who was the 1937 Nobel Prize winner for physiology and medicine, he made great advances in the study of vitamins. Uh, he has this great quote, uh, which is in many, many botany textbooks, that what drives life is a little current kept up by the sunshine. So what does that mean? I think we're going to have a song in a minute, not you, Pete, yet. So uh, plants are autotrophs. It means they make their own food. Photosynthesis, which takes energy from sunlight, uses carbon dioxide and water to make sugars. And this is the basis of our entire um, web of life on Earth, or nearly the entire web of life, as I'll mention a little bit later. Not quite. There are actually 
some autotrophic bacteria that use hydrogen sulfide and they give off sulfur. So if the oxygen evolving life forms hadn't won, we would all be exhaling sulfur. We would be like dragons. There are other, there are, there are other important autotrophs. So let's see if this works. This is not, we're not going to the internet. I wonder what's going to happen here. Okay, that didn't happen. Hmm. Didn't play, interesting. Right, we might go to the internet, okay, uh, to hear it. So here's a cross section through your um, dandelion that's growing in your lawn. Here's this wonderful, don't think of it as a weed, think of it as an autotroph. I, I, I don't know whether, I, I think it'll, it may not be on that slide, it may be on a different slide, we'll see. But I, I, can, I can hook up, it's the photosynthesis song. We're going to have a song about photosynthesis. Okay, so if we take a cross section through the leaf, this is a cross section. You can see the different parts. And this is one plant leaf cell, and there's uh, little chloroplasts in it, these little green things, which actually their ancestors were uh, bacteria uh, millions and millions and billions of years ago. And this is where photosynthesis is happening, and all that. Uh, those sugars are being fixed. This might work here. This, could, this is it, this is it. Sorry, it was on the wrong slide. So think of all those leaves out there as being little factories producing sugar, starch, proteins, amino acids, and nucleic acids. And this is a, a page in an old biology textbook for high school from the 1930s where it describes the leaf as a factory. So the workrooms are the cells and the machines are chlorophyll. It's really cute. I think something's going to happen now. Let's see if we can hear it. Oh, here we go. If you want to know how a plant grows, it takes water, air, and sunlight, <laughs> and makes cellulose. Every plant can do this fundamental process, and we can call this photosynthesis. Unlike me and you, I love this song. Okay, um, and I think we can just go, this, I'm going to test if this works. I don't know if this is going to work. I'm just going to pass it on. Kind of stop there and go back. So I do recommend if you have to, if you're in high school or you know someone in high school who has to learn photosynthesis, get them to watch that. It's a total earworm. They'll totally know photosynthesis <laughs> afterwards. And I play it for my students. Oh, here we go. Let's go to the next one. So I'm just going to go to, since I'm hooked up to the internet, a really lovely one-minute overview of, and it really is one minute where you can see photosynthesis clearly explained. Here we've got our solar energy. It's coming in to the plant, which has got xylem, which is sucking up water from the ground, taking it to the leaves. Here are the stomata. These are the pores in the leaf, which are opening to let the carbon dioxide go in. There's a carbon dioxide molecule going in. Closing, there's another one coming. <laughs> and now what's happening is, this is the chloroplast. The ancestor was a, was a bacteria. There's light energy coming in. It's really good. And we've got water being split up. Oh, it's not showing the water being split up. It's having complex chemical reactions. I like that. Acid, you, you don't need, there's a final exam on this tomorrow at York. My students need to know the steps. And then the oxygen is given off and 
then we have phloem, which is carrying the sugars away. So there you go. Everything good is on the internet as well as everything bad. Okay, so that's photosynthesis. And we see plants as green because uh, the dominant pigment that does photosynthesis is chlorophyll. But as you can see in this photo from High Park last fall, there's many other pigments. There's reds and yellows and oranges, and they're all part and parcel of photosynthesis. And uh, this was a little article in um, the free metro paper that you get on the buses and the subways where I um, gave an interview about why the leaves were late in changing color last fall. It was all about leaf chemistry. So one of the things that uh, plants have to do is balance their need for carbon dioxide against uh, the need for the water. And when those pores get open, the water just evaporates. And uh, this actually creates a trade-off because the water is needed, but the plant is losing it. If the plant closes its pores during its those stomata during the day, uh, the temperatures in the leaf rise way too high and uh, photosynthesis slows down because there isn't carbon dioxide. The oxygen isn't being given off. So what you can see here is I've got some wilting leaves, well known in my house. I don't water things properly. Oh, sorry, hang on a minute. Sorry, I need to close this down. Sorry about that. <laughs> sorry, too much about photosynthesis. Sorry about that just uh, all the te technology. Then you can see here that where we've got, we give the plant water, but where the yellow arrows are, the leaves can't survive, they've died. But where the green arrows are, if you can see them, oh, I have this, hold on a minute. So here we have our wilting leaves, not enough water. Here we get, we've given the plant water, and here the leaf hasn't recovered, it's too far gone. But this leaf here, it's perked up, and so has this leaf. So what this uh, actually means is that if you're a plant growing in very high temperatures in warm environments, uh, you have a problem. You are losing often too much water. So in fact, over evolutionary time, we've got two other kinds of photosynthesis have evolved, C4 and CAM, which allow plants to do their photosynthesis in different places and at different times to conserve the water. And uh, many uh, uh, cacti have these kinds of photosynthesis, as do many plants living further south. So one of the challenges of a warming climate is our crops that are growing in Ontario have a C3 photosynthesis, and they're not well adapted to warmer temperatures. So this is just by way of a little bit of a, trying to get us to reflect on changing climate. So if we think about dinosaur extinction as happening about 65 million years ago when that asteroid hit the Earth, flowering plants, which are the dominant plants that we see in our gardens and around us, they first appeared about 125 million years ago, but seed plants and vascular plants actually have been around for 400 or so plus million years. And vascular plants are ferns, they're mosses, uh, they're gymnosperms, they're Christmas trees. They all have evolved this, these special cells, xylem and phloem, to move water through the plant. And what you can see here are white tulips that we put into different uh, containers with different colored ink uh, in, in our second year plant biology class, and you can see this transportation tissue is throughout the flower and throughout the plant, and it's moving this colored water around. So that's vascular tissue. Um, wood, which was needed to support plants once they got out of the oceans onto land, is also something very, very old. It's been around since about 360 million years. So plants. Um, been around for a long time, but the current plants that we rely on for most of our crops are much more recently evolved. Oh, here's just to tell you, here's a, here's a fossil seed. Um, fossil seeds have been around for about 365 million years ago. So those early plants from 400 million years ago would have looked something like this, not at all our landscape of today. 
What we rely on today is something that showed up about 125 million years ago, which is the flowering or the, or the fruit plant. And this fossil found in China, it's Archifructus sinensis, the earliest excellent flowering plant fossil, uh, would have looked something like this. It doesn't have flowers and fruit like we know it today, that, like we know these things today. It had very simple leaves and probably lived in um, wet environments. Okay, so that's my botany piece, um, just to get you thinking about the fact that plants have been around for a really long time, and they form the, the basis of uh, the pyramid of life here on Earth. Okay, going on then to planting trees and gardening. Um, in case you don't know who this is, it's Wangari Mathai. She uh, has sadly uh, passed away. She died a few years ago, but she won the 2004 Nobel Peace Prize for her work with planting trees in Kenya. Um, okay, fossil fuels. This is, now we're on to climate change. So the challenge that we're facing with all of the things that we do today, with the natural environment, whether it's preserving native biodiversity or growing our food, is it's all being, having to be done under, a shifting, um, under shifting climate change conditions. So what we're doing is we're literally putting into the atmosphere a lot of fossil fuels which represent carbon that was fixed in the Carboniferous era, about 360 to 290 million years ago. The plants that formed coal and the um, diatoms formed oil, those are like tiny little uh, algae, but the coal-forming plants have descendants that are around us today. This is what they would have looked like, ferns, mosses, conifers. And in fact, the boreal forest biome represents the descendants of all of those coniferous trees that formed many of those fossil fuels that we're burning today. Okay, um, it's very clear that if we keep on burning these fossil fuels, we're really changing life on Earth. What does that mean for our biodiversity and our food? Well, the ways in which we're actually studying the impacts of climate change uh, are, are many, but you can go to just north of Toronto to Jokers Hill, which is the University of Toronto Field Station, uh, or, I think it's south of Maple, um, but they are doing these experimental warming arrays where they're actually changing the local environment to see what's happening. So there's a lot of cool research going on there. We already know that our gardening zones have actually shifted. And I'm going to hopefully get to this website, which is going to show us how they're moving north. And if we play here, we can see that the conditions for growing plants is getting milder even here in Ontario. So you'll see here how the gardening zones have shifted. We can, I'll do that, I'll reset that. But this is uh, from 1990 to the 2006. We, we don't have such cold temperature, and it means that plants that could only survive further south are now able to do better further north. It doesn't mean we're going to be growing bananas in Toronto anytime soon. So ecosystem services, what are those? Those are the services that the ecosystem provides us, and the most important one is food. Lots of other benefits as well. The reality is that our agriculture system today is international, huge, and industrial. It may, however, surprise you to know that the global food supply is dependent on only 14 main plant species. So we as humans, agriculture dates back um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, we've been domesticating plants. The ancestors of chickens come from China, the ancestors of sheep from Mesopotamia. Only six plants provide more than 80% of the total calories consumed directly or indirectly. It's wheat, rice, maize, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and manioc or cassava. And you can see all the different kinds of rice in my local no-frills. So this is really shocking when most people hear that. 
The other eight main global crops are sugarcane, sugar beet, common beans, soya beans, barley, sorghum, coconuts, and bananas. Uh, so we have a lot of carbohydrates. We supplement uh, that diet with these protein-rich legumes. We, we do have leafy green veggies, but they're, they're not part of that main 14 uh, crop species. And of course, we use olives, sunflower seeds, etc., for uh, oils. So a few interesting other facts that, that I'm fascinated by. There are anywhere from 300,000 to 450,000 flowering plants that produce fruit, depending on how you are describing the species. But only 3,000 have ever been cultivated for food. And of those 3,000, only 150 were ever widely cultivated. And then we have our 14 um, most important global crop plants. And as a result of all of this cultivation, it means that we've been moving species around everywhere. They're bringing other species with them. Some of them are pests, and some of them are causing all kinds of economic and ecological problems. So there is great interest today in reclaiming the idea of local and diversifying our crops and our food supply. Also because under a warming climate, it's not clear that many of our major crop species will, will adapt well to future climate conditions. So when we're talking about uh, using our gardens for more than growing lawns, part of what we're talking about is maintaining our ecosystem services and also creating local food security. And for me, this photograph shows more than anything why we want to be interested in this in Canada. Here is Heinz tomato juice in my local Parkdale uh, no frills at $2.37. And here's that same one liter of tomato juice up in Nunavut Pond Inlet for nearly $20. So there's great interest in people in the north actually getting better local food. So we are very well placed to, to do this down here because we're sort of in, in one of the top uh, crop growing areas and one of the highest uh, biodiversity areas for Canada. Um, I've been involved in some research on how best to um, bring local food and greenhouses to Canada's north, and, and it's a pressing issue, that's for sure. So I think a lot of people are very concerned that we think about food security and what its link is to sustainability and sustainability and biodiversity conservation. So I'm going to turn to the gardening part of my talk, having given you all that sort of background information on botany and ecology, uh, and we'll get to local food here. This is my favorite photograph of a Toronto garden. This is a photo taken near Bathurst and Dundas. And uh, this very enterprising gardener has sh turned uh, pails from drywall compound to grow all kinds of food. So we can do this everywhere. And you're sitting in Mississauga on some of the best soil in Canada for growing local foods. Here's uh, an aerial of my own very small downtown back garden within a block from High Park. And what you can see is here's the lawn. That lawn has since disappeared. Pete has dug it up to grow kale. And over on this side is a very productive small garden growing all kinds of herbs, coriander, um, cilantro, summer squash, lots of tomatoes, basil, and one of our most an important and only, one of only two crops native to this region. And this is the Jerusalem artichoke. It's, it's a sunflower. There's Pete, who's going to sing for you in a minute. I'm actually going to get you. Can you come start setting up, Pete? And um, while I get you up here to sing the whole inch by inch, row by row song, which is one of my favorite songs, I'll tell you about native crops. Wild rice and Jerusalem artichokes are the only two native crops to the Great Lakes region. Uh, Ch Jerusalem artichokes were later taken over to Europe. They grow anywhere and they were known as a peasant survival food. They have recently become a very trendy vegetable. Um, even if you're a beginner gardener, you can grow 30 to 60 pounds of Jerusalem artichokes per year. We grow them in an area of about uh, three square meters, less than three square meters. And here I'm turning them into a tasty bisque. 
So Pete, take it away, and then we'll have the rest of the talk. And I've got things to give away, and uh, cloves of garlic from our garden. You can grow those too. Thanks, Pete. had John Denver and the Muppets because it's on YouTube. Thanks, Pete. That's great. So I, um, I think it's really um, important to um, understand that I'm a plant ecologist and a botanist, but I'm also a really keen gardener, and I do bore people with lots of information about the botany and the history and the evolution of plants. But it's very important if you're going to do successful gardening, in, in, in my opinion, to know about these things. So let's carry on here. So wild rice, if you've ever been to Rice Lake, uh, you'll probably know near Peterborough that this was a very important crop for First Nations. So those are the two native crops that are indigenous to this part of the world. The, the, the three sisters that you hear about, corn, squash, and I think, is it tobacco? I don't know what the other one is, Be beans. They actually were all um, traded up to this part of North America from further south. Their home ranges are further south. Okay, so um, I hope that, uh, I'm, I'm gonna give you some ideas now on how to get gardening, both for local biodiversity and for local food. So there's a huge renewal of interest in the last 15 to 20 years in heirloom varieties. And Vesey's uh, garden catalogs, Vesey, V-E-S-E-Y, it's a Canadian company, and you can order all kinds of seeds from them. And you can see here on the top right, 
some of the heirloom tomatoes that we grew in the last few years in our garden. And they're really tasty, very easy. This is a, a good beginner thing to do. Anyone can grow these. Anyone can grow Jerusalem artichokes. Uh, also, there's a lot of these interesting purple carrots that a friend of mine down in Massachusetts uh, grew and, and gave me. The other thing that's incredibly easy for everyone to grow is rhubarb. This is non-indigenous, it's non-native, but it does very, very well in this climate. And I've actually got, if you're going to stick around, some of my uh, rhubarb strawberry um, apple pie filling. Very easy. Uh, and you can, Bernardin, which makes our local mason jars, it's the Canadian canning company, they have got all of, well, pretty much all of their recipes are online. Um, oh, sorry, that should have been, sub we, we, we got carrots in two. There was supposed to be something else. Sorry about that. Last year, Pete, who is learning how to, uh, to grow more crops, diversified, and he grew okra, ladies' fingers. It was incredible. I had only ever had okra that was bought from the supermarket. It, it, was, it, it is kind of gummy. It has this gelatinous gumbo thing going on, but if you like it, um, you'll love fresh okra. Remarkably easy to grow. So where can we actually find seeds and bulbs? Here's an, another view of our back garden. Uh, again, lots of online sources like West Coast Seeds, they will tell you whether these varieties are good for our local climate. Things like nasturtium you can buy at your local no frills. You can eat nasturtium. Nasturtium pesto, excellent. Edible flowers. And you can see here is me collecting um, my own dill and my arugula seeds uh, and just putting them in brown bags and storing them that way. Very easy to do. Finding out what's going on in your local community is, is there's many sources of information. Uh, in the last in, in about six to seven years ago, in our local neighborhood, the Horticultural Society of Parkdale and Toronto organized for a couple of years tours of people's local gardens. So this was an interesting garden with lots of raised beds for accessibility um, in, in a house near us. And this is a local church um, on Bloor Street at Bloor and Peel, where the uh, church members were actually growing vegetables and they were giving a lot of them to the local food bank. So there's a lot of these cool community gardening efforts. Okay, um, right, this is coming up again. <laughs> I guess I really like that one. Let's go on to native biodiversity. We blend in our tiny garden lots of food. Oh, sorry, hang on a minute. Forgot to tell you about this. This was an important one. Okay, it was supposed to be garlic. I forgot to put the garlic picture in. Down here, you can see garlic. Um, and I've actually got, uh, if you're interested, this is some garlic from last year, and I'm happy to give people cloves. I ordered these, and these are very well adapted to our climate. I got these from BC, but I chose a bunch of varieties. So come and get a clove and plant it. Turn it into a garlic bulb. Very easy to do. We actually get our entire garlic supply for the year from our back garden. But... And this is, this is where I'm going to just turn to the science of everything. Um, because um, of you, you don't want to get uh, local pests accumulating in the soil, we actually do a three-year rotation. So one year the garlic is here, another year the, gar year the garlic is here where this raised bed is, and in another year the garlic will be grown here. So this is a tiny garden, and we are doing agricultural rotation. You can do it anywhere. You really can. Um, and I should add that I have two degrees in grass biology, which is why I try to encourage people to dig up their lawns, because lawns that we aspire to grow really well in Ireland and in Scandinavia and in Britain because of those, that warm, moist air from the Gulf Stream. But we are not in a good area for growing that kind of green lawn. It's much, you'll probably be happier if you can turn your lawn over to something else, but keep it for young children. So we actually kept small lawn because Sapna has a young child, so you do need it for children. You can dig it up later. 
Um, okay, um, so, so here's our garden, and everything you can see here is a native species. Jack in the pulpit, Virginia bluebells, polemium, uh, Jacob's ladder, uh, Canada anemone, everything here is native. Uh, more native plants, bloodroot, uh, sharp-lobed hepatica, very lovely, violets. They all grow in the temperate forests of the Carolinian zone, and they thrive in our gardens. Where to find plants and seeds? There's lots and lots of local, uh, local clubs which will guide you, but two ways to get them. You can collect some for yourself. So here we've got Parthenocissus quinquefolia. I'm trying to think what the common name is for this. Growing up trees and poles in my neighborhood. But you can get, um, what is Parthenocissus quinquefolia? Virginia creeper, thank you. I, I'm thinking in Latin names, sorry. But you can, you can uh, collect the berries and grow your own. Here is a milkweed, common milkweed. Very easy to collect. Um, but I just want to point out here that um, you do need to be a little bit uh, careful to make sure that you're getting the right seeds. So the milkweed seeds look very similar to this dog strangling vine. They're actually very closely related. And I wanted to put this in here because we've got, this is a problem invasive non-native um, Himalayan balsam, which is invading lots of local wetland areas in Ontario, and this is the native jewelweed. They're the same genus. So a lot of times, the problem native, the problem invasive non-native species are often quite closely related to native species that we would quite like to grow. Okay, what else is going on here? Ah, here's a native lily, a Michigan lily in our garden. And then here you can see an Asiatic lily, and it's covered in this invasive bug, the red lily beetle. I've actually started doing research on these because all the lilies, both native and non-native in my garden, were trashed by these. So now we do research on them in my lab, finding out ways to control them. And we've actually been pretty um, effective at eradicating them from local areas. Um, I wanted to show this slide because this is Japanese knotweed, which grows through uh, concrete is incredibly invasive, and somebody in my neighborhood put it out for people to take and grow in their own garden. They put this in this nice pail, and I was like, oh my gosh, they're actually spreading this problem species. So you do, it's very easy to do a little bit of research and find out what's going on. Uh, lots of native trees and shrubs. Here is a tulip tree. This is a tree that thrives in the Carolinas. It's in the magnolia family, and its range is moving northward under climate change. Here's um, a choke cherry. Here is a, a nice um, sumac. Thank, I was going to say thank you. Rus typhina. It's awful when I, sorry about this, when I get into my Latin names. Um, it is possible to battle um, the non-native and native garden pests. Here's a in, very invasive uh, Japanese beetle. This eats everything. It's totally trashed our roses. Here is um, a small um, caterpillar that is, um, is quite invasive. It's a looper of some kind. And here again is that red lily beetle. Okay, so finding out sources of information about what, where to, what to grow, how well it will do is actually pretty easy. I didn't know Anne was going to be here, but of course, your local libraries are a huge and important source of information. Likewise, botanic gardens, likewise, your conservation authorities, and there's lots of local shows. I'm going to tell you about one that's going on on Saturday in London, as well as the Green Living Show. Lorraine Johnson, who is based in Toronto, has written numerous fantastic books on gardening advice. Her latest is called Urban Farmer. Um, I think it, it is in the library. Uh, I, I know because I, in the Mississauga library, I know because I looked it up. Okay, what I wanted to tell you about next was that there is a new program and I've got a whole bunch of information at the front. Uh, lots of, oh here, hang on a minute. Um, yeah, handouts. 
This is the new In the Zone program that's been launched by Carolinian Canada and World Wildlife Fund, where they are making, if you sign up for this, uh, you will be connected with experts on how to uh, improve the native biodiversity of your garden. That will officially launch end of April, right? Um, as well, we've got the Green Living Show this weekend, but if you have friends and relatives near London, uh, Carolinian Canada, which is one of our longest standing regional environmental NGOs, is having the Go Wild, Grow Wild show. I've got some cards about that at London in the Agriplex on Saturday. And the, there'll be tons of uh, people who uh, are experts in uh, growing and propagating local native species. So that's a great thing to do as well. Okay, the Botanic Gardens. We have got in Toronto and Hamilton two fantastic organizations. Um, I put in here my trellis. I'm a member of the Toronto Botanic Gardens, which is uh, really keen on developing adult education and children's education. Loads of excellent outreach, very affordable programs. And then there's the Royal Botanic Garden, which has a wealth of information at hand. So depending on what you want to do, there is information, inexpensive information for everybody. And I would encourage you to seek some of this out. We know now that we can't preserve enough of the natural landscape of southwestern Ontario. We've industrialized it, we've urbanized it, and we're farming it. So we have to do other things. And I'm just going to end here with um, Michael Pollan, who writes about food. And I think this is a great quote. And you can see these are a whole bunch of, what are these seedlings growing in our? Milkweed. Pete is happy to take your name and send you native milkweed plants. He's grown, we, can, we only have space for three in our garden, and he's grown about 500 of these seedlings. So Michael Pollan says, the single greatest lesson the garden teaches is that our relationship to the planet need not be zero sum, and that as long as the sun still shines and people still can plan and plant, think and do, we can, if we bother to try, find ways to provide for ourselves without diminishing the world. And I want to, I'm going to take questions now, and we've got stuff to give away and lots of information. And um, here is our fourth year applied plant ecology students at the beginning and end um, from Keele campus. Uh, we did a lot of field work last fall at Glendon College, which most of them had never been to the campus. And it actually has amazing And they were just shocked to think that they would have spent years at York University ever visiting Glendon College campus on the Don River. And uh, they all, it, it, was, it was really a great experience. So, um, you know, get out and get to a garden. And with that, I'm going to end and give away garlic cloves and take questions. Thank you for listening and thank you, Pete, for the, uh, the musical interlude. <laughs> Are you moderating the questions? Oh. Thank you. And Sat um, Satma's just bought a house, so she has a big garden, and I have to go and apparently do <laughs> things to it. Yeah, put stuff in it. <laughs> Right, so let me go to the milkweed for, I'll go to the Jerusalem artichoke because milkweed is an easy one. It turns out that, here we are, there's Pete digging up the crop. Um, milkweed is a really important food plant for monarch butterflies and monarch butterflies are um, under, they're, they're not doing well. The populations aren't doing well for a whole host of reasons, including agricultural practices further south, the fact that milkweed has been on the noxious weed list, uh, so farmers would have to eradicate it. Uh, so there is a, a big push to uh, have people grow milkweed in their gardens to uh, provide a food source for, for monarchs. 
it actually, it, it, not particularly, it does have that, that very, um, that wind dispersed seed, but it's not invasive by, by any stretch of the imagination. You can keep it under control, which is not the case for Jerusalem artichoke. Um, so what you can see here, we well, can't see, but we spend a lot of time containing our Jerusalem artichokes. Here, here, here it, it's Helianthus tuberosus. So it's a tuberous, it really is a sunflower. Um, and what you can see here, that tiny area in purple um, has got a piece of plastic embedded because it just spreads like mad. It will actually grow in the stoniest ground, which is why I think it's really funny that it's become this sort of rediscovered gourmet vegetable. And this bisque that um, I made and Pete likes to make was introduced in the Sterling Inn in Niagara Falls, which is a boutique hotel, and the restaurant called A.G. Silver only does local food and local wines, and it's sort of terribly trendy. Um, it's, a, it's a converted milk bottling plant up the hill from the falls. It's sort of right at the back. You go right, right up that sort of tacky hill of all the you know, waxwork shows and everything. And uh, we got the recipe from the, um, from the chef there. And uh, Pete actually just bakes it. It's unbelievable. We, you've actually started planting less because we just couldn't get through this supply. Like we're eating so much from our garden, but it's, it is a different taste. But once you get used to it, it's quite delicious. Um, no, you can actually contain it. We, I, I, we just keep it corralled because it, is, it's, uh, it, it has a rhizome. So you can, as long as you know exactly where it is, just keep it contained. Um, we were growing about five, six plants there, and, the, and they just grow huge, and uh, Pete would dig them up. Do you want to comment on, or is that sort of covers it? It's, it's great. We, we've given it very easy. We can arrange for you to have some. We got ours in a local supermarket and planted them. I would, uh, you know, it, it's, it's pretty cool, but, but with the proviso that it is slightly invasive. And tall and beautiful flowers, just these gorgeous flowers. I, I use them as cut flowers. <laughs> yeah, flowers in late August, September. They are, they are beautiful. Every day. Yes. Yeah. They're, it's amazing. Um, I had a visiting professor from a university in India, and she grows okra in her garden near Camp Carson. And she would, every, when she was at our house, she'd be, we would just spend the whole time taking photos of the flowers. They're so amazing. Oh, and, and there was a, a lady over here, and then this gentleman. Go ahead. So that's a good question. What other flowers do we plant for native pollinators? So coming up spring, I've got a lot of spring ephemerals, bloodroot, hepatica, uh, Virginia bluebells will come, jack in the pulpit, uh, and can, uh, Canada anemone, which is invasive as well. That one you have to really contain. Um, we've got columbine. I did have a lot of native columbine, but I had trouble keeping it alive. So I do have just um, ordinary columbine, which is a European columbine. So we do a lot of mixing in, in our garden because I want to have flowers all the time. Um, going into the summer, um, native lilies, but then of course they got attacked by this red lily beetle. So um, I've been very concerned about that and I had a student doing research on that. Um, what else do we have that are natives? We've got uh, Parthenocissus, Virginia creeper. We, we pack an awful lot in there. There, there pretty much isn't anything um, that isn't a native plant here that you couldn't probably find a place for in your garden. And of course, because we've got prairie, so people are always shocked to discover 
that we actually have patches of prairie in oak savanna, which are these plants that do very well in the sun. So there is a whole suite of species like hoary mountain mint. I have a whole bunch of things there because I've done a lot of field work in southwest. So I just know what I like from what I'm seeing in the field, and then I'll introduce it to the garden. Um, and if you have a garden that's shady, we've got a lot of woodland plants as well. So you can plant that pretty much any soil and any uh, kind of sunlight, light conditions. It's, it's, you, can, you can map it out. I think if I was going to be doing a bigger garden, um, you would simply... Um, follow the rules in the, peren the Harrowsmith Perennial Garden book, where they just, they just scale up and you would just do a lot uh, bigger patches of certain species. But we have something flowering through the whole summer. And I have roses as well. I mean, I have just traditional things as well. And I have loads of herbs, and the insects love herbs. So any herbs you're going to grow, um, they'll love. Does that help? Oh, and there was a gentleman over here, and then a lady... Ah, how are you doing that? Okay, so I actually do a huge amount of research and reading on the internet. So even though I did do my master's in botany, I'm always going to the extension services and Guelph U University. Actually, most people think I'm a professor at Guelph. Ever since I've come to York, people always go, oh, you're at Guelph. I'm like, no, we do plant stuff at York too, you know. Um, so what, what I do is um, I actually season it. So when we take it, when I take, I read about this, so this isn't me, I read about this. Um, I take it out of the ground and in the shade, stick it in the basement. You have to let it kind of dry out a bit because that stops it. And then we've been keeping it in the equivalent of our, our back um, in the cold, in, our, um, in the dark, because you, you don't want the light to get it going again. Because when it starts to go soft and everything, it's, it's because it's starting to reactivate. It thinks it's spring, so you need to keep it cool and dark and dry it out a bit. I would just advise, um, just, um, so what we've done here, I can show you is, uh, you can come up and have a look. This is still pretty hard. So this is now going into April. So I did, um, I did it's like a seasoning, a drying out, and keep it in a, in a relatively, it's been in our back, it's been in our back porch though, it's still pretty hard. Yeah, and I just leave it like that. But I'm also doing um, a hard garlic, so, um, you know, there's soft neck and hard neck. This is a hard neck. Oh. Yeah. So you're doing the right thing. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Do you know what variety you're doing? I got these from. Ah. So, so I would suggest come and take one of these home with you from our garden, um, shake it off. So I actually did quite a bit of, uh, of research and I got it from a west coast from BC and I think I'm growing Russian varieties, like from Siberia or something like that. But it was, they were really designed for um, a colder environment and I'm wondering if it may just, just try a different variety. I've got two in here and you're very welcome to. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Oh, you have, yeah, you, good to keep them separate. I've got them mixed a bit right now, but I kept them separate for a while. I would, I, I, if, if you're running into that problem, I would try a different variety and see. I suspect it, ha it sounds like you're doing everything right. So it may just, sorry? Garlic scapes for garlic pesto. We freeze that. Excellent. I do too. Yeah. I, so, so one year I did this kind of baked garlic, um, garlic marmalade or something, and you had to bake it. I got some recipe because canning garlic, you can't really preserve it without pressure because of the, the, the spoilers, the clostridium, the botulinum spores. And I remember I burnt my fingers. It was delicious. But um, yeah, we just do this. I would stick it everywhere, but there are ways. Do you can garlic? Do you actually preserve it? Oh, 
other than freezing? Okay, and then you freeze that. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to say maybe put it in your freezer because garlic in the fridge, you do have to be a little bit careful about the spores. Oh, the scapes, the scapes are fine. The scapes are fine. Yeah, yeah. Okay, excellent. Oh, well, that's good, good. Okay, um, we'll talk later, and I'm going to get you to read e Eugenia Bone. I'm paranoid, because I do a lot of canning, and I'm really afraid of poisoning people. So I'm always trying to get everybody to heat process everything. But, um, but that's excellent. But there are ways to, so your pH, we'll talk about pH. I didn't bring a pH. The next talk that I have to do is preserving food, because that's very chemis chemistry. Okay, sorry, there was a question here. Ah, do you have red lily beetles in your garden? Because of that, yes. So um, the, what we actually did was if you can get them, okay, so quickly about lily beetle life cycle. So they overwinter as an adult, it turns out. So I had, a, I had an amazing student, remember Noah, who was never had it in anything on time, but he was an incredible natural historian. And this guy followed the life cycle of these red lily beetles, and he did work that nobody else has ever done. We haven't yet published it. It turns out that the, that the beetle overwinters as an adult. It's univoltine. That's the technical name. It doesn't go through multiple generations. So if you can get it as it's emerging in the spring, because that's when it lays its eggs, those bright red eggs on the underside of the leaves, and they're very easy to see. If you can get them all before they lay the eggs, you can literally, with two years of that, eradicate your lily, the lily beetles from your garden. I guess it depends how big your garden is, but they are attracted to lilies. So we've been um, trying things like bait plants. We've been putting out lilies to see how quickly the beetles come. It takes them a while to find the plants. Um, if you put a higher concentration, you could literally get them all as a bait. You can eradicate them. They're all, it is, it is, it is labor intensive. You just, well, you pick them off and kill them. Uh, and, and they're really easy. They do, they do this cool behavior where if you knock them off the plant, they fall on the ground and they waggle their legs in the air and the underside is brown and they mix in with the soil. But um, we, got really, we got really good at this. Um, I mean, he did visit about 80 gardens in Toronto to check them. But um, I was surprised, as somebody who studied sheep and snow geese, how quickly I became adapted to studying insects so that I could have lily flowers. I was very motivated. I was very motivated. I was very worried about the Michigan lilies, the native lilies. And it was remarkable. We've ac we actually cleared them out. You have, to, you have to kind of do it early when they come out. And, but they're very easy to spot because there isn't too much green stuff. And if you can get them at that point, there, there will be no, no new eggs in your garden. Because then those eggs hatch and what happens is that those beetles stay alive until the next spring, which is when you, you can like interrupt the life cycle. Um, yeah, so, so, oh, so, so are we out of time? I guess we are. Uh, actually, I have a question. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Right, so glyphosate, which is 2,4-D, um, the, the weed basically grows to death. It, 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 it mimics a plant hormone, and it just keeps on growing. Um, so the issue of weed killers and pesticides is um, a complicated one, because we have invasive plants like dog strangling vine and Elantha's tree of heaven, where you really need, we're not going to get any biological control um, an insect that will just eat it to death. Uh, so, and they're, they're spread too far wide. So we actually need to use herbicides. Uh, to my knowledge, um, it's only cleared for very specific 
reasons and you have to have special permits. Um, so in the provincial parks and the national parks, we had, and, 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 and it's, things are getting, it's getting tighter all the time. Um, I would say that for local homeowners, as long as your garden isn't too, so 24D is a herbicide for weeds, but then um, insects, things like diatomaceous earth, um, the Japanese beetles, of course. So, so we're really trying to have a pollinator-friendly garden. Um, so we're trying to avoid using uh, pesticides. And the main thing that I would advise everyone to do is learn the life cycle of the pest. So I always say, who, who knows, who's watched Day of the Triffids? The Day of the Triffids. So it turns out that in the Day of the Triffids, when you spray ocean water, they are not tolerant to soil. And so I always say to my, when I'm teaching plant biology, if only they knew the life cycle of the Triffids, they wouldn't have killed everybody on Earth. Um, and the work that we're doing with the Japanese beetle, to a lesser extent than the red lily beetle, is showing those key points of intervention where you can extend a little bit of effort and you actually can get on top of that local population. Obviously, if you're growing in agriculture, um, farmers, they do a whole suite of, um, of pesticides, integrated pest management. Um, so you need to have a bunch of different approaches. But I think that for a lot of, of farmers, there's a real recognition today that um, the more pesticides and herbicides we put on, the more resistance evolves. Like we're, it's actually a form of natural selection and evolution. And so the pesticides and herbicides we're putting on, spraying on way more, it's toxic and the bugs and the weeds are resistant. So is this really a way to go? We have to think of other ways of tackling this. But um, 2,4-D is needed for some things, actually. Yeah. Was there another question that that gentleman had? Oh, let's go. Oh, oh, hi. Oh. How long have I been gardening? Um, ever since I was your age. When I lived in England, and that's my mum and dad at the back, I did have my own little garden in London. So I've been really keen on gardening forever because I'm old now. So are you a gardener? Excellent. There are so many great gardening books. And the librarian, I don't know if Anne is still here, but she would point you at them. And she's been librarianing ever since she was little as well. And so there was a gentleman here. You had a question. Oh, no question. Go ahead. Ah. So I, yes, you can, you can. Um, so, so you were asking me how long have I been gardening? Here is an excellent book from the Ontario government, Ontario Weeds, and it will have some information on purslane in it. So we could look that up um, and it will might give us some ideas on what, how to eradicate it. I would, I would um, you know, it's amazing. Um, creeping bellflower. I mean, okay, so there is an approach. You can, it's called, I'll just speak in, I don't know whether people can hear. It's called the LTL approach, the learn to love them approach. You could, you could do that. So in Arctic Norway, um, giant hogweed is a revered, and they have a perennial species. It's not the biennial like we have here that's a problem. Um, and they actually um, depicted in art and weavings and jewelry, and they love it because it is this crazy tall plant <laughs> that survives in the Arctic, um, even though it's really annoying. And I actually discovered that a lot of our most invasive species were deliberately introduced. Um, it was grown as a test species um, in the 1930s and 40s for cattle. They actually brought it to Norway and grew it as a crop. And, but, but things like purslane, they're just associated agricultural weeds. And interestingly, on that note, I would say that in Europe, many of those agricultural weeds that were associated with traditional farming landscapes, as 
farming got industrialized, a lot of the weeds actually started to die out. And now there are conservation programs to keep those weeds alive as part of the cultural landscape. <laughs> so, um, it, so biodiversity, it depends on your perspective. These, they're really annoying and I'm obsessed with red lily beetles and creeping bellflower and eradicating it from our garden. Actually, at one point we had um, Canada anemone took over uh, one whole bed and I made peat, we sifted, we dug everything up, we put all the um, native plants onto the side and I made him sift the soil to sift out. And, and this is where these plants are. It's so amazing how they can grow. So with the, um, with the Jerusalem artichoke, if you have a little bit of the rhizome, that much it will sprout and turn. And likewise with many of these, these rhizomatous plants and these seeds. But I think that if you make a lot of effort, you can do like an integrated pest management approach and you can get the population down. You can, if you can suppress it, you can actually um, get it to a manageable level. Um, and the other thing, of course, is be really careful about what you accept from other people. So people keep giving me gifts of house plants and they've got white fly on them. And I've been battling white fly for several years in the house. Yeah. OK, so I, I guess I should wind up now. I think we need to wind up. But thank you, everyone. And I would encourage everyone to come down here, take an In The Zone. Please sign up.